We have an absolute epidemic in this country. It's a health crisis like we have never seen before in the entire history of our country or the world. Half or more of the people that you know have this. The epidemic that we're facing is diabetes. And together we have to figure out how to solve this before more of our friends and family die of this deadly disease. What is diabetes? Diabetes basically means there's too much sugar in the blood. And why does that happen? It can happen for a couple of different reasons. Number one, your body's not producing enough insulin. And unfortunately, that's much more difficult to cure. Number two, the cells in your body no longer respond to insulin, which main goal is to lower the amount of sugar that's in your bloodstream. When that can't happen anymore, you have diabetes, type two. In the year 2021, 12% of people were diagnosed with diabetes and 33% had prediabetes. By the year 2030, it's expected that those numbers will rise and 15% of all Americans will have diabetes and 40% will have prediabetes. So more than 50 out of 100 people that you know or encounter have one or the other. And that's not to mention worldwide. I know people will be watching this worldwide, but as more people adopt a standard American diet, those numbers skyrocket in their countries as well. In the United States, in the United States, most of the cases of diabetes and prediabetes are from my neck of the woods. And if you see the name of my channel, Southern Keto, you know I mean the Southeast United States. South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas. Well, Texas is not really in the southeastern United States, but we claim them, as well as West Virginia. Those states have the highest incidence in the United States. And why is that? We're going to find out right after this. In this video, we're going to find out what is diabetes? What can we do about it? How can you reverse it if you have it? as well as some helpful tips to help you reverse it and to keep you on track. These seven doctors that I've compiled together are going to answer every question that you have about how to cure and reverse diabetes. From lifestyle changes to diet, they can tell you all you need to know to take control of your health and get rid of this terrible condition that's affecting so many in America and around the world. I just want to quickly put this map up this is a map of the United States from 1994 to 2014, 20 short years. This map was released by the CDC and you can pause the video and take a look at it right here. But basically all that red you see is terrible. The CDC was not founded a hundred years before that, but imagine what the map would look like if it were. In our grandparents' time, diabetes was almost unheard of. Down here in the South, they called it sugar. My sugar's acting up but very few people had it. And why is that? We're going to get into that in this video also. But from 2014 to now, 20 short years later, the map looks even worse. They've not put the graphic out for it yet, but when they do, it's going to look absolutely awful. I want to apologize for some of the quality of the video that I've put in here, but the message is so important. I felt that I needed to put in some older footage too, even though it may not look as good on your screen. The information was crucial to the making of this video. I want to start with Dr. Oz because everyone knows Dr. Oz, no matter where you're at in the world. And he's going to discuss diabetes and one of the first steps that you need to do to reverse it. Let's talk for a second about diabetes. A lot of people think it's genetically in, in, in you. You can't change that. It is true that probably a third of how you age is genetic in general, and diabetes is no exception to that. But that means two-thirds of whether you develop an ailment is based on your lifestyle. Dr. Oz says obesity drives diabetes. If you get rid of the excess belly fat that you have on board, that old mental fat, you can drop your incidence of diabetes probably 90%. You heard me right, 90%. Think about that. Either less medications or no medications if you get rid of the belly fat. His main tip for diabetics, lose that belly fat. So that starts out with walking half an hour a day, smart to do anyway, but that gets your muscles churning through sugar. So it gets your body hormonally in a better place, plus it gives you, some, you know, a little bit of confidence, you can do things in life. 
Number two, all the white foods you gotta go. White sugar, white bread, white pasta, all those are big problems for diabetics in particular, especially folks uh, who are uh, you know, from the Pacific Basin, who have a genetic disposition uh, to, that inhibits their ability to live with a lot of excess food in their shelves because they quickly put on belly fat. It's a wonderful opportunity to take advantage of your genes by cutting out the white foods. You will effortlessly, seamlessly lose weight. And I had to show one of the most widely viewed videos of Dr. Eyes on the Oprah Winfrey show discussing the same thing. This was a long time ago and it's gotten so much worse now. So let's start with what it is. What is diabetes? So one of the biggest challenges we run into is folks call it a little bit of sugar, right? Yeah. So write it off, it's not so important. I want to be crystal clear on this, so I made an animation. Okay, so let's, love that. Let's pretend you put some food in your mouth, okay? And let's just say it's some tortillas with a little bit of cheese on it. It's pretty benign looking. Goes into your mouth, into the stomach, it just freezes for a second. So there's your stomach digesting the food. There's the liver, which has to take all the nutrients to decide what to do with it, including making sugar out of it. Gallbladder is the green stuff. And this organ right here, that yellowish thing, that's the hero today. That's called the pancreas. Let's run this forward. The food goes through the stomach, into the small bowel, the bile, the green stuff, and the yellow stuff from the pancreas, they mix. And there's the pancreas there doing its best to keep up. The food is being washed like you wash soap off, some grease. And the molecules of glucose or sugar get absorbed into the body. Now, that's cut into the bloodstream. The sugar now is traveling around, and these little particles here are insulin. And these insulin particles are being released from the pancreas. And what the pancreas is trying to do, freeze us for a second, is to take the sugar, these blue dots coming in are sugar molecules, and the insulin is saying, come to me, come to me, like a funnel. It's allowing the sugar to go past the bloodstream into the tissues. Goes to our brain. Our brain can only use sugar to think. Makes us think better. Goes to our muscles so we can exercise, right? But it does other things too. Now, what happens, run this forward, if you have too much sugar going in? We store it in our belly. That's how our ancestors survived. But that belly fat, the omentum gets ponderously large. And as it does that, it poisons the insulin so it no longer can work and the sugar cannot get out of the bloodstream. That's a problem because in the heart, the blood vessels are very delicate. There's a Teflon lining and the sugar, like, like pieces of glass shards, scrape at it. And you see that little hole that's starting to make on the inside of the artery? As the our body scars and attempt to heal, it's a fragile repair. It breaks. It ruptures. Now you have an open surface that's sore, Oprah. When, and you have a cut anywhere, you form a scab on it, right? Yeah. Same thing in the, in the body. You form a scab in the artery. It gets larger and larger and kaboom! Right there you saw the leading cause of death in diabetics because a diabetic will most likely die from a heart attack from that very reason. Over one quarter of the patients that I operate on every day have diabetes. So Dr. Oz mentioned that you need to get rid of the belly fat to begin with to start reversing your diabetes. So how do you do that? One of the best resources I've found is Dr. Ken Berry. And in this clip, he's gonna show you how to get rid of belly fat fast to start reversing this terrible condition. A few years back, I was actually morbidly obese myself and suffered from Dunlap. That's something we talk about in the Southern United States. It's when your belly Dunlapped over your belt. So I am somewhat of an expert on losing belly fat, both as a uh, clinician and as someone who suffered from lots of extra belly fat. Now, I'm sure you think I'm going to tell you to eat less and move more, join the gym, eat lots of rice cakes, but nothing could be further from the truth. As you've already discovered, those things don't work. They're not sustainable. Number one, when you go grocery shopping, stick to the outer aisles, the outer wall of the grocery store. That's where you're going to find all the natural foods. That's where you're going to find meat, eggs, cheese, full fat dairy, some vegetables, some berries. These are real foods that your body actually know how to use and they're not going to lead to increasing belly fat. They're actually going to help you burn that belly fat off quicker. Number two is choose only one ingredient foods. Okay. So if something has more, more than two ingredients, whatever the ingredient is and maybe salt, don't buy it only buy one ingredient foods. Your body knows what to do with ribeye. It has one ingredient. Your body knows what to do with broccoli. It has one ingredient. Don't ever drink a carbohydrate or a sweetener, okay? So this applies obviously to the soft drinks. This also applies to the fruit juices. If what you're about to drink contains even one gram of carbohydrate, don't drink it because your body doesn't know the difference between added sugar, or natural sugar. And so whether you're gonna drink a Pepsi or whether you're gonna drink some organic grape juice, it makes no difference. It contains sugar. 
It is going to make you build belly fat instead of getting rid of it. Number four, eat at least one gram of protein per kilogram of your body weight every day. Protein is satiating. Also, your, your body needs all of the amino acids contained in that protein to renew and rejuvenate itself. So the protein is not optional. Uh, eating this much protein a day may be new to you, but I promise you it's going to keep you fuller for longer, and that's going to keep you from eating the junk and make the belly fat keep disappearing. Eat more fat. And I know you just went, wait, what? Yeah, eat more fat. Fat is the most satiating of all three macronutrients being fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Carbohydrates don't really satiate you or fill you up at all. That's why you have to eat every two hours if you eat lots of carbohydrates. Also, eating carbohydrates turns immediately into sugar or glucose in your blood, and that spikes your insulin. Anytime your insulin's high, you ain't going to burn that belly fat. My favorite is the fat found in fatty cuts of animal meats. You can also eat plant fats, that's fine, but eat lots of fat every day. Number six is eat plenty of real salt. I know, again, you're like, wait, this doctor just told me to eat salt. Yes, yes, I did. Here's why. Many times when you get a craving, that craving is actually for salt or for a mineral. It's not actually for the Cheetos or Doritos. So if you eat plenty of salt each day, and it's a real salt, so it has minerals in it as well as sodium and chloride, then you're going to be giving your body all the minerals it needs, and you're not going to be having weird cravings that make you wind up going to the center of the store where all of the processed carbohydrates are hiding in plain sight. Recognize your sugar addiction. Any carbohydrate breaks down to sugar. Sugar hits our pleasure centers in our brain, just like some illicit drugs. It's absolutely, without a doubt, true that some people are very, very addicted to sugar. Limit your alcohol intake to one serving a day, and this needs to be a carbohydrate-free, sweetener-free drink. And so if you make a mixed drink, make sure that you use something that has zero carbs and no artificial sweeteners because any sweet taste in your mouth is going to raise your insulin level. And when your insulin's high, you ain't burning no belly fat. And stop all sugars, whether added or natural. Okay, so if you drink a two liter of Coke, that's a ton of sugar. If you eat a full bag of those beautiful, delicious Niagara seedless grapes, that's also a ton of sugar. Your body can't tell the difference. It doesn't know whether the, the sugar came from Pepsi or orange juice or the big bag of grapes. Stop eating any sugar and your belly fat will start to melt away effortlessly. Implement some degree of intermittent fasting into your lifestyle every single day. Try to go for at least a 16 hour fast. So if you sleep for eight hours a day, then that means you would you would wait four hours after you wake up to eat your first meal, and you would stop eating four hours before you go to bed. You don't have to do this every single day, but I want you to move towards doing a 16 or 18 hour fast every single day, because when you're fasting, your insulin level is very low normal, and that's the sweet spot for losing belly fat effortlessly. Avoid protein bars and protein shakes. Now, wait a minute. I thought I told you to eat lots of protein. Yes, I did. The problem with protein bars and protein shakes is that they're very often mislabeled. If you look at the total carbohydrates and the protein and the fat, most often, almost always, they're highest in carbohydrates. So they should really be called carbohydrate shakes and carbohydrate bars. That's not going to help keep your insulin low normal. If you want to eat a protein bar, then cut your ribeye in strips and hold it like this and call it a bar. That's a protein bar. If it comes in a plastic wrap in a cardboard box, that's a carbohydrate bar, and that's never, ever going to help you burn fat off your midsection effortlessly. This next doctor I had not heard of before I started my research into reversing diabetes. I was pre-diabetic. I never advanced into diabetes. Thank God, because I found people like this that helped me along the way to regain my health, lose 75 pounds, lower my blood pressure, and help me get in the best shape of my life. But Dr. Hallberg did studies and clinical trials on diabetes and diet. Let's take a listen. Let's 
begin by talking about a trial that I am fortunate enough to be the primary investigator of. It is actually the largest and the longest trial of type 2 diabetes and a ketogenic intervention. There are 400 intervention patients, and of those 400 intervention patients, 262 of them have type 2 diabetes, and the remainder have prediabetes. This trial was sponsored by Verta Health and is occurring at Indiana University Health here in Lafayette, Indiana, at the medical clinic that I am the medical director of. Now, what happened with these patients? Well, first let me tell you a little bit about them. The average age of the patients in this trial was 54. They were about two-thirds female, one-third male. And the average BMI of the patients coming into the trial was 41, which was quite high. And many of them had the diagnosis of type 2 diabetes for a very long time. So what was the intervention? The intervention was that we gave them individualized carbohydrate nutrition instruction with the goal of getting them into nutritional ketosis. Now, what makes this trial different than others is that we actually were able to show that they were in nutritional ketosis because we were checking their blood ketone levels on a regular basis. So, what happened? Well, let's start with weight and weight loss. And one of the important things to say is that these patients were not calorie restricted. These patients were instructed to eat until they felt full, ensuring that they were getting an adequate amount of fat. So what happened in only 10 weeks to their weight without restricting calories? Well, in only 10 weeks, the weight dropped by over 7% on average. And you might want to say, hmm, did that last? Well, our preliminary six-month results show not only did the 7% last, it almost doubled. Because at six months, the average weight loss was 12%. And once again, I want to remind you, this was without calorie restriction. And that is a really critical piece. If you're constantly being told to eat less and less, that can be difficult over time. There was a trial by Dashti published in Molecular and Cellular Biology. And this trial actually was a very long trial, extending out over 54 weeks. And what we saw with weight loss was not only was the weight loss incredibly significant, just like we saw in our trial here, but it was sustained over the trial, over the 54 weeks. Another very important study was done by Bowden and published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Now this was a very short study, with the intervention actually occurring only over two weeks. But what do we see with weight loss in that short period of time? Guess what? It's incredibly significant as well. So once again, when we look at weight loss in these three trials, we see consistent results. Now, of course, this was a study about diabetes. So what happened with patients' blood sugar control in our study? Well, again, in only 10 weeks, in the patients with type 2 diabetes, they had a dramatic drop in their blood sugar, represented by a 1% drop in their A1C. Now, A1C is an average blood sugar over three months, and 1% is an incredibly significant decrease. And we see this decrease occurring no matter what their starting blood sugar or A1C was. It went down in everyone. What about the other trials? In the Dashti trial that we talked about before, we see once again consistent results with the decrease in blood sugar. Blood sugar decreases and stays down. And how about in the short Bowden trial? Same thing. Not only do we see a decrease in blood sugar, but this is happening over an incredibly short period of time. Patients got normal blood sugar levels in the two-week intervention period. But once again, I'll point out that these are consistent results.
Our trial showed something that was simultaneously occurring that was thought not to be able to be done, which was that improvement, that significant improvement in blood sugar while these patients were taking less medications. So our patients had better blood sugars with less medication to control those blood sugars. In fact, on the patients who started the trial on insulin, in the first 10 weeks alone, 87% of those patients had their insulin levels decreased or totally eliminated. Think about that. In a patient who had been taking insulin for years, to be able to get off that medication in only 10 weeks, that's a quality of life improvement, but we also know it's also a financial improvement because these medications, insulin and the others that we were able to decrease, cost a lot of money. And it wasn't just blood sugar control that was improving. Cholesterol improved as well. In fact, in only 10 weeks, the triglycerides of our 262 patients with type 2 diabetes improved 22%. That is a dramatic improvement in a known cardiovascular risk factor, again, occurring over a short period of time. So we know that blood sugar in the blood is what diabetes is. So Dr. Stan Eckberg is going to explain in this next clip how to lower your blood sugar and take the next step towards reversing type 2 diabetes. Did you know that following the guidelines of the American Diabetes Association will give you diabetes? I have so many patients asking me, what am I supposed to eat? I read this article and I went on this website and I talked to my doctor and they all told me to eat low fat and high carb and, and I'm pre-diabetic, what do I do? And it's really, really tragic that still in this day and age, the physiological principles are so definitely established. We know exactly the mechanism, and yet the official guidelines are in direct opposition to what gets you healthy. There's a great book called The Schwartzbein Principle. It's a medical doctor who has allowed herself to think for herself. And she found that if she had pre-diabetic patients and she gave them low-fat, high-carb diets, they developed diabetes every time. And then she thought about it and she turned it around and she gave them low-carb and high-fat and high-protein and they reversed the diabetes. This has been established since 1850. Even before we knew what insulin was or how it worked, they knew that you reverse diabetes with low carb, you lose weight with low carb, no doubt about it. And then we figured out how insulin works, that insulin is a storage hormone, that insulin develops and insulin resistance, which prediabetes is, develops only in response to sugar and carbohydrates. And yet, to this day, we hear that we're supposed to eat low fat and high carb. So we've developed this fear of fat that totally deprives us of any logical thinking. We're so afraid of this fat that whatever it takes, just eat low fat because after all, it can't be good, can it? And yet, there is no scientific evidence ever that a high quality fat causes any kind of disease, yes. Trans fats, processed vegetable fats, vegetable oils, corn oils full of uh, toxins because of the processing, those are not good fats. Good fats are butter, extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil, natural fats. They will not harm you. Here's something to understand though. Insulin is a storage hormone. So whenever you eat sugar or carbs, your body produces insulin. Insulin takes the sugar out of the blood and puts it into the cell. The cell uses what it can, but it can't use a whole lot, so it converts the rest of that into fat. And then, once you eat more sugar and your insulin stays high, now that insulin tells that cell to hold on to the fat. 
As long as you have high insulin, there's no way for your body to retrieve that fat and use it for energy. So what your body is supposed to do is to have a balance between fat storing and fat burning. But when your insulin is high, the prevalence is to store the fat, store the fat, store the fat. And then of course you get hungry because you have no access to that energy. Now here's a little trick that you, we kind of have to keep in mind that even though fat is good and carbs are bad, you can't eat carbs and fat at the same time because eating the carbs will store fat and keep you from retrieving the fat. So it's okay to add in a little bit of fat while you learn to eat less carbs, but you can't keep eating more of those because the carbs are still going to store that fat. So what you want to do again you reduce the carbs over a period of time and everyone is different so I don't know what it's going to be for you to reduce that insulin resistance but a great way to, great thing to measure is your A1C measure it reduce your carbs see what happens as you get closer to 5.0 your insulin resistance goes down and then you can eat as much healthy fat as you want and not only will you not gain weight, you will also not develop diabetes. If you're pre-diabetic, you will reverse it. And that is the only way. Insulin resistance is pre-diabetes. It is triggered by sugar and carbs. But any carbohydrate will trigger insulin. And bread is just one step away from sugar. Sugar is already sugar. Bread is just 10 minutes away from sugar. Once you eat it and you start digesting it, it turns into sugar and it's going to trigger insulin. So it doesn't matter if it is brown rice or whole grain bread. While, those are, while whole grain is better than white toast, it is still a carbohydrate. It is still something that if you're insulin resistance or if you want to avoid insulin resistance then you can't go that way. So what carbs do is they increase your blood sugar. Fat does not stimulate your blood sugar. Maybe a point or two but it does not create a lot of volatility in your blood sugar. So if you want to run the test, the reason I mentioned the A1C is that it's a long-term measure of your blood sugar. Whenever you have sugar in the blood, some of it gets stuck on your red blood cells. So what they measure is hemoglobin A1C. It measures how much of that sugar gets stuck over a period of time. And since the red blood cell lives about three to four months, the A1C gives you a really good average of how much sugar was in your blood over a three to four month period. Once you start cutting back and if you measure after a month then you might have come down a little bit and your real improvement is bigger than it shows because some of that sugar was already stuck in the first two months. So you can measure it. Uh, it's an inexpensive test but I would probably suggest you measure it every couple of months. And if you can drop a tenth or two every, every couple of months, you're doing really well. So how do you know if you're insulin resistant? What, what are some of the, the signs and symptoms, if you will? When one, one classic sign is if you get tired after eating a meal, it's because your body can't process it properly and the blood sugar shoots up and then your body expends a lot of energy converting that blood sugar into triglycerides or fat. So that's one thing. But you can have many different presentations and a lot of people have what we call a roller coaster blood sugar. So another thing is irritability or the inability to go for several hours without a meal. Your body is designed to create level blood sugar and when you don't eat it has mechanisms to maintain blood sugar from stores of fat and glycogen. But if your body can't do that, if you get irritable, if you get hungry, if you get lightheaded, if you get headaches, 
If you feel like you have to eat something every two to three hours, then you probably have insulin resistance along with hypoglycemia because you've taught your body to rely on sugar or carbohydrates for energy. Relying on sugar, you increase your insulin levels and now you can't pull energy out of your fat stores. So your body doesn't have a backup for energy and that's why you have to keep putting all that food, all those snacks, primarily sugar and carbs because that's what your body has learned to live off so now you depend on it. Increasing fat and protein, move away from the carbs gradually and before you know it you'll find that you have a little bit more stability and then you can cut back further and you increase the fats and a healthy person you should be able to go six to eight hours without fainting or irritability or anything like that but one other thing that you want to keep in mind to reduce insulin resistance is exercise and we're not talking exercise to burn calories and lose weight we're talking about activating the body making your muscles do work makes them more sensitive to insulin there is a physiological change in the receptors there's something called a GLUT4 receptor on the muscle and when you start using that muscle it will take more blood sugar in with less insulin. So insulin resistance is what we've been talking about all the time. Insulin sensitivity is the opposite of that. So exercise will make your muscles more sensitive. So they will take that blood sugar, they'll burn that energy without the insulin. So you want to cut your carbs, Reduce your, your, your carbs and your sugar. You start with the worst ones, the what we call the white trash, the white flour, the white sugar, anything processed that is completely devoid of nutrients. But then you follow through and you reduce the what they call quality carbs that still are not a good human food. We've been told for so long that carbs are necessary. Carbs are glucose is what your brain runs on. Well, it doesn't work like that. Your body can make glucose from all sorts of things and in the absence of glucose, your body will prefer something called ketone bodies, which is what you have every morning when you wake up or after a fast or a period of starvation. We're very well adapted to using things besides glucose. They tell you that carbs are necessary. That is not a fact. There are essential fatty acids from fat. There are essential amino acids from protein. There is no such thing as essential carbohydrates. That is a myth and a lie. You can live for years and years without a single gram of carbohydrate and you would do really well and you would not develop diabetes or heart disease or anything like that. Ask the Eskimos, they do it all the time. And if you are worried about eating zero carbs, then you don't have to worry because everything almost has a little bit of carbs. When you eat your spinach and your lettuce and your carrots and your cauliflower and your broccoli and your kale, they all have carbohydrates. It's just the best form of carbohydrate because it's not a grain. It's fibrous and water rich, so it's absorbed almost infinitely slow. It has virtually no impact on insulin. That's why those carbs are, they have close to a zero glycemic index. So to sum it up, what do we eat? You cut back the sugar first, you cut back grain second, you eat as much vegetables as you like. You eat as much healthy fats from avocado and nuts and healthy oils and fats like we mentioned, the butter, olive oil, coconut oil. And you eat a moderate amount of protein and you get the best quality protein that you can. You want, if you want to eat an animal, which I'm all for in moderation, make sure it lived like an animal supposed to live. Animals were supposed to live in the wild, they eat grass, they have a healthy life, they eat, have lean bodies 
and they have a very develop a very healthy fat ratio omega-6 to omega-3 if the animal was healthy then it is healthy for you to eat it as long as you have a good digestive system dr. Westman is from Duke University one of the top medical schools in the country and he has clinical experience in using low-carb and ketogenic diets to cure diabetes and here's one of the talks he did where he discusses just that let's go back in time actually about a hundred years ago before there was any heart disease. Heart disease was a rare event at this time. And but diabetes was known, and the treatment of diabetes, Elliot Proctor Joslin was one of the prime uh, teachers at the time. In 1893, he recommended a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, as shown in the case description of this patient, Mary H. Dietetic treatment is of the first importance. Remember, this is 1893. The carbohydrates taken in the food are of no use to the body and must be removed by the kidneys, thereby entailing polydipsia, polyuria, puritis, and renal disease. That's lots of thirst, lots of urine, uh, and um, itching, and renal disease. Mary H. was put on a stringent diet consisting only of protein and fat. The beneficial effects were seen at once. She gained five or six pounds and was advised to eat all the cream, butter, and fatty food possible. <laughs> Why are you laughing? It's, <laughs> it's what I use today. Honestly. Frederick, it's not just Elliot Joslin. Joslin Clinic, Boston, today. It's the clinic's named after him. Frederick Allen did, was the one who really did a lot of the research. In the treatment of diabetes mellitus in humans, Allen employed fasting, then a stepwise reintroduction of macronutrients to find the threshold at which the urine glucose developed, glycosuria. First, the patient was fasted, no food, until glycosuria, urine sugar, was no longer present. Then carbohydrates in the form of green vegetables were introduced. We would call them low glycemic or non-starchy vegetables today. Starting at 10 grams per day, total grams, not net grams, no sugar alcohols, no none of these other things today, and increased until the glycosuria threshold was reached, until urine was seen, uh, glucose was seen in the urine. They couldn't check blood glucose at the time, so they were using urine. Today we know we can do better than urine, we can actually check the blood. Um, the carbohydrate intake prior to the appearance of glycosuria was considered the optimal amount of carbohydrate. This level was maintained and then protein was added to the diet, beginning 1 to 1.5 grams of protein today, which is interesting. That's the recommendation by all of the pundits today after all of the research we've been doing, even when you're losing weight, a gram to a gram and a half of protein per day. To find the glycosuria threshold for the combination of carbohydrate and protein. So it was known in the early 1900s that protein in the food would increase the blood sugar and increase the urine sugar even then. Well, lo and behold, this diet is the same diet I was studying in 2000 and trying to be squelched. So I thought something was curious to this. So the diabetic diet in the pre-insulin era, the quantity of food required by a severe diabetic patient weighing 60 kilograms was 10 grams of carbohydrate for the whole day. 75 grams of protein, 150 grams of fat, and 15 grams of alcohol when I show this slide, my patients want to volunteer for the study on alcohol. Um, <laughs> but the strict diet was meats, poultry, game fish, clear soups, gelatin, eggs, butter, olive oil, coffee, and tea. Here are the, the research papers at the time. Um, and um, so I was really studying nothing new, although in the context of what you just heard about 20 or 30 years of being told other things, this had been forgotten. If you look at the guidelines, what happened over time, and, and you can read these, nobody really knows for sure. There was no pivotal study that said using medications and a high-carb diet is better than a low-carb diet. That study was never done. It needs to be done again today to, to uh, put this on the, uh, put low-carb, high-fat on the same um, randomized trial evidence of everything else we assume, like drugs, and I th think we need to do that. But all of the associations, I think Ansel Keys was a part of the association uh, getting on, uh, associations are getting online to use high carb, low fat diets for diabetics because they die of heart disease. And we all know now that fat in the diet causes heart disease around 1970. And so they stopped telling people with diabetes to reduce carbs 
and they told them to reduce fat without regard to the carbs and the glycemic control, et cetera. So basically, a chronic disease was started called type 2 diabetes with insulin treatment and insulin resistance. And this young uh, child is saying, I'm learning to manage my type 2 diabetes with insulin while he's eating all this stuff. Um, not, it's kind of chilling to know that children actually are in this kind of situation. So um, what does the science say? I mean, okay, that's 100 years ago, Dr. Westman. I mean, well, 2005, Gunther Bowden puts people with type 2 diabetes in on a research ward. We know exactly what they're eating. One of the main limitations of our work and other outpatient work, even with clinical trials, is we don't really know what people are eating. This is the best study if you want to know what happens I'm with people where you know exactly what they're eating. Annals of Internal Medicine, 2005. You can see in the black bars, glucose is higher when they're eating their regular diet and the glucose goes down on a low carb diet, the open, um, open circles. And then on the bottom, the insulin levels go down as you would expect. When you eat less carbohydrate, you have less insulin. This is really, this was taught as physiology and then forgotten and now rediscovered in randomized trials that are very costly to do, may I add. Um, but it's not just Gunther Bowden. One of the first meetings like this in 2004, we got Dr. Bishop to come over uh, from Europe to just show that if you didn't eat carbohydrate, the glucose didn't go up and the insulin didn't go up. Again, it's basic physiology that everyone had forgotten, but this is the replication or the first study, but no, that's okay. There's some more research, and if you want to make sure that it's on a different continent, that the humans who live in Australia are similar to the human, anyway. <laughs> so this is a study by Manny Noakes, uh, the CRSI, uh, CSIRO in Australia, in Adelaide, and then red, when you have no carbs in the diet, the red lines, there's really no rise in glucose and no rise in insulin. And in this study, we, we, really stood out by saying, let's give a diet tolerance test, not a glucose tolerance test. It makes no sense to give someone on a low carb diet glucose to see what happens. Let's give someone on a low carb diet a meal that's low in carb and see, what's hap see what happens. So um, we, we're using methods and standards derived from carbohydrate eating and applying it to a different situation, which to me calls into question just about every theory that has been developed from that world. But so yeah, in um, diet specific glucose tolerance or meal tolerance tests, there's no rise in glucose or insulin after not eating carbohydrates. When I was faced with, okay, it works for obesity, and I thought the low hanging fruit would be, let's now use this for diabetes. 100 years ago, it's what they used. In the DCCT, which is a, a diabetes control trial, where they're using 230 grams of carbs per day in the, the intervention diet, the best they could do with medication in a high carb diet was an A1C of 8.9 or 7.1%, normal being under 5% optimally or under 6%. So I went to visit doctors who were using this kind of diet in clinic, and under the best circumstances when people are following the diet, which may be you, know, you not people in a randomized trial who, are, who may or may not be following it, uh, they were achieving normal blood sugars off medication using a low carb, high fat diet. So I visited these practices, said let's write up articles, and we did them. These are published and never cited. I didn't want to hurt anybody. Primum non non cherry, did you see that? First do no harm. Um, do people really need to eat carbohydrate? World panel saying you must. World panel saying 120 grams are used by the brain of glucose, so you must eat 120 grams of glucose. <laughs> did they forget or maybe not know that the body can make glucose? When you look on who's on those panels, they, really, they didn't have physiologists, didn't have people like Steve Finney who did the studies were knowing. So I was presenting research on low carb diets and people didn't believe me, so I had to start following one myself. And, and people would say, well, that can't be true. People need carbs. And I would say, I haven't had a carbohydrate in six months and I'm here. And then suddenly, <laughs> suddenly people would believe the science. I mean, is there, is there such a, a lack of faith in the research that Nobody believes even, so it's kind of crazy. This, um, this, uh, so you really don't have to have carbohydrates. The Institute of Medicine in the US has the best unbiased source of information about this and look up on their website. The lower limit of dietary carbohydrate compatible with life apparently is zero. 
provided that adequate amounts of protein and fats are consumed. Even then you can see that's hedged a little bit and we might even say uh, the emerging evidence that it might even be healthier to not eat carbohydrate if we really updated that with this conference in Tampa just in January on metabolic therapeutics using ketones. It's fascinating to see this. Um, and you need to look at the year that things were written because a lot has changed in the last two years, okay, let alone 10 years. I reviewed a paper recently where they looked at the guidelines from 2004 as the, no, to throw them out, look to Sweden, look to other places that have looked at data um, for carbohydrate restriction in type 2 diabetes, uh, the daily study wasn't quite as low in carbs, down to 110 carbs per day. The Westman study, that's Will Yancey and I, really are the only ones who dared to go down to do what Frederick Allen and uh, Osler did 100 years ago, the 20 gram, <gasps> it's so low level. Um, it's not so low, okay? Um, it's okay. Um, and what we found out in our 2008 study was that the low glycemic index diet works. No question about it. Low glycemic, low calorie will work for diabetes, but the low carb ketogenic diet worked better. So you're gonna see people citing things, fantastic, a lot of things work, and there are a lot of things that work for different people, but if you compare them head to head, the lower you go on the carbs, the better the glycemic control, recapitulating what had been known before the medications were available for the treatment of diabetes. So there's been a, a um, resurgence of research Research, you know, uh, on this uh, Saslo, uh, so Laura Saslo, Jeannie Tay, uh, Satori Yamada, and um, uh, um, Dr. Meyer, who was, did a sub-study of the Duke study. Um, pretty much the same theme. You can improve and uh, diabetes, get weight loss. Um, the good news, now that the pharmaceutical industry is in the obesity treatment world, we have studies on using medications to treat obesity and diabetes, and diabetes gets better. So uh, if you want to use uh, that information, I didn't use that here, but with the weight loss by whatever other method, surgery, medication, diet, you'll get weight loss and improvement in diabetes. But the lower you go on the carbs, the better you'll do, I think. And here's why. It's right in front of your face. And as a pimp question, meaning if one of my students or residents with me are really kind of jerks. I say, okay, how much sugar is there in the bloodstream at any given moment? You know, you can figure this out. Uh, but, and, uh, you know, the two Japanese medical students I've had uh, taking my rotation at Duke knew just like that. I don't know if it's a millimole thing, or, but you know, our students, go, oh, millil I say, okay, is 100 milligrams per deciliter is a normal blood sugar. Remember that thing uh, for now taught in, um, in middle school or grade school where you take, you know, a thousand grams or whatever. Yeah. There's five grams of sugar in the entire bloodstream at any given moment. It's roughly a teaspoon of sugar. I think the best written description I've seen of this, Mike, is at the Protein Power uh, blog where you go through this in, in text form. Um, so basically, when you look from the blood sampling or blood situation, five grams going around at a given moment, and you throw in 200 grams in one meal, or, or let's say the diabetic recommendation, diabetes association of 45 grams per meal, this is gonna overload the blood sugar. If you can't control it, the blood sugar is gonna go up. Oh, we actually for a long time taught that it's normal to have an increase in blood sugar after a meal, because that's what everyone was doing. But is that optimal, okay? So you don't have to have a blood sugar rise after a meal. Um, there's a spoonful of sugar in the entire bloodstream. So what do I do today? The research money is drying up. You know, I'm a clinical doc, clinical research fellowship at Duke, but I, my heart really was in the clinic with patients. Let me go back to the clinic and start using this at Duke. We opened up the Duke Lifestyle Medicine Clinic now about 10 years ago. The lower you go on the carbs per day on the y-axis, the more likely you are to have ketosis. You saw the, um, the, you know, the um, on Dr. Finney's slide, that area where you want to get for optimal ketosis. I don't do that. I, I just say, let's get down low and let's see what happens. Um, most people do really well. People come to me for it to work the first time. I say, well, let's do 20 grams or less. Let's just go back to what they were doing 100 years ago. The science looks good. Um, 
not only for diabetes, but for obesity and, <coughs> and hypertension and polycystic ovary syndrome and heartburn and, and uh, fatty liver and irritable bowel syndrome. We have studies published on all those things. Um, what do you eat? It's unlimited meat, poultry, seafood, and eggs, but I know you're not going to want much. Eat all you want, but I know you're not going to want much because you're not hungry. That's the, how it, it works. Um, limit the foods uh, uh, at the bottom, two cups of salad greens, one cup of a non-starchy veggie, then you get a, a, a small amount, a limited amount of cheese, mayonnaise, um, uh, cream, things like that. I think those are limited because they're high in calories. Uh, you can eat too many calories on a low carb diet. It still works by lowering the calories. So, but we don't count them in the teaching. Okay. So you could do it, bacon and eggs or sugar-free yogurt with berry slices or, or not eat anything. I think Dr. Fung will talk about that. Um, it's so easy to not eat anything. That's a, it's a great slide. Um, it's so hard not to eat when you're out traveling. And, uh, so I'm starting to use that in my, my teaching, actually. You know, the, I've learned a lot from the running on fat as fuel. And by the way, what kind of weight do you want to lose? Uh, fat weight? Yeah, so you want to be a fat-burning machine. That's really helped in the teaching of this for people. Um, so you can do it. I just had a gentleman, young man, lose 40 pounds in two months by eating two double cheeseburgers, no bun, at a fast food restaurant. Okay, two, two of those burgers, you know. I, I'm, Jimmy Moore and I go back and forth on food quality versus carbohydrate quantity and the main factor in my experience is carbohydrate quantity. And it would be a shame if someone thought they had to have grass-fed this, organic that, so that therefore they couldn't do it. Because I see it working without regard to any of that just by lowering the carb quantity. So, uh, but not to say that you shouldn't do those things, just many of my patients can't do it. So what can happen today, and uh, great to see more and more practitioners here using the low carb ketogenic diet as we coined the term, or low carb high fat diet as it's coming out of Sweden. Um, 100 units a day, you just add up all the units, a long acting unit, a short acting unit, count it the same, a, a unit from your, your um, insulin pump, count it the same. You know, they're now units of insulin that come 500 units per cc, it used to be just 100. So the medication world is trying to go up and up on the insulin. When remember that slide, the pathophysiology of diabetes, type two diabetes, there's already too much insulin. So you want to reduce it. So anyway, cut the insulin in half on the first day, otherwise you'll get low blood sugars and they'll blame you for the, the problem when it was really over medication. So you have to be careful. I worry about the spouses and the family members of my patients who get taught by me in an hour long clinic because if they're on medication and the medication becomes too strong, they're gonna think that it was the diet that caused it when actually it was the medication. Important point. But pretty much you cut, unless the glycemic control is way out of bounds, cut the insulin in half on the first day. When a blood sugar goes down, you cut back on the insulin instead of eating up to meet the insulin. This person came off 100 units of insulin in six weeks. So this is a small multiple. I'm gonna show a bunch of these. The, Minimum and maximum glucose at the beginning was 120 to 140. The blood sugar is, is as good as before, 110 to 130. The person lost five pounds over six weeks off all of insulin. Not bad, huh? 80 units a day off in one week. This person was on insulin, actose, metformin, other med oral medications. Blood sugar is as good or better than before on no medication. Add up all the insulin, 60 units off in two weeks. Doesn't matter if it's multiple times a day, how long people have had the diabetes, it seems, off 100 units in three weeks, 180 units in one week, 160 units, four weeks. This person had been on insulin for 25 years. There's no happier patient than the patient who comes off insulin <laughs> and who has been told they're gonna to have diabetes forever. I've seen doctors' lives be transformed because they were given tools that didn't work, they cared about their patients, and they started doing this, and their lives have been, now they're happy, going to work, seeing people who are happy. So it's not just a patient being happy, it's a doctor, 
being happy. What if a country could be happy or a, a corporation or a, or a public health system? It's just a matter of time, don't you think? 250, 300 units of, of insulin off in a month. 500 units of insulin still on after 10 weeks. But this fellow is spending a lot less money. He's in that uh, area where the insurance isn't paying for it, got to pay for it on his own. And um, I mean, this, this person is injecting 100 units five times a day. Um, it, it's, uh, it's really kind of obscene. You know, I wish I could say words like you, Andreas, insane. This is insane. <laughs> now, the way I see it is that the food contributes partially to this, but if insulin resistance, the underlying cause for the diabetes is still there, you may have to be, you may not have normal blood sugar control for a while, okay? So, um, let's see, this person, 140 units, eight, we, oh, this is person's on a pump. Um, type one on a pump, no problem with type one, you just need a lot less insulin, less insulin because your insulin or your medication is titrated to the carbohydrate in the diet, you lower the carbohydrates, you lower the insulin. Um, and let's see. Uh, some people say, well, you haven't shown me the hemoglobin A1Cs, which is a measure of three months over time. It's okay. Uh, here, the hemoglobin A1C and the y-axis under 6% off medications when the person had an A1C of 9 for, I mean, this is now, they had an A1C of 9 for 10 years. Okay, so the x-axis is here in years. Um, so this is not, uh, um, you really don't need a randomized trial to show that this is effective. What you need is a randomized trial to show that it's safe and not harmful or, or different than other methods that you use. So the terrible thing would be to have an uncontrolled study, have a ran one or two random events in a low-carb arm without randomization to, uh, to know that it, really, it was just the process of weight loss or not this particular method of doing it. Uh, this person, this is the internist's dream for a treatment. Diabetes, hypertension, GERD, uh, that's heartburn. On the, 80, the Diabetes Association diet, on uh, insulin and pills, checking blood sugars four times a day with an A1C of, uh, let's see, seven. People would say that's goal. That's straight endocrinologists would say, this person's fixed. On medication, hemoglobin A1C of 7%. Now on low carb, high fat, low carb ketogenic diet, however you want to say it, has lost uh, you know, 60, 40, 50, 60 pounds, is off all the medications, has no heartburn, no hypertension, no diabetes. It's so unbelievable, people don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly. And, and so that's why I have an open door policy. If you want to come see this as a practitioner, and, and there are other practitioners around the country, around the world, who will be happy to have you sit in their office. And when I look back, that's how I learned. I went and sat in the office of Dr. Atkins years ago to get me through all of the barriers that you've just heard about today to see the effects that can happen. And then we formalized it into research. Now, I work in a clinical uh, group where other university professors are there and kind of looking, you know, well, we share patients and after two or three patients that I fix, mutual patients, then they refer everybody to me. There's a four to six month waiting list to come in to see me. I'm sorry about that. But at a university that says, you are really in demand and they like that you're so important, people have to wait for you. Not good customer service. But so one of my colleagues down the hall said, gosh, that Westman, you know, I, you know, he says he can fix diabetes. What if we get someone who's never had any treatment for diabetes? This was a 64-year-old male, BMI, body mass index of 29 kilograms per meter squared, first onset of diabetes with a hemoglobin A1C of 10.5%. Uh, there in red, looking back, the prior one was 5.9%, you know, three years before. Just cut the carbs, and he, so what he says, cut the carbs and I'll send you to Westman, you know, send you to the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic. And the A1C was normal, 5.5%, no medicines used, just dietary change. I, maybe Dr. Osler and Dr. Jocelyn are smiling, looking down, because we're recapitulating through years of, of insanity, according to Dr. Ian Felt, Basically now having to raise, the, the bar of evidence is pretty high now. In fact, 
One might argue, it's been argued in editorials, that only pharmaceutical companies can afford the trials to be done to, to show the evidence. Now, if you know someone, friend or family that has diabetes, please share this video with them because they may have tried everything, all the medications, everything their doctor has told them, but they may have never heard this and this knowledge could just save their life. Dr. Sean Baker is one of the doctors that has adopted a carnivore diet, which is not for everybody and you don't have to do that to reverse diabetes, but I think it's one of the quickest and easiest ways to do it when you eliminate basically all the carbs that you can. It's gonna be a quicker route to achieve your goals. In this clip, he discusses, do they have the cure? Are they hiding it from you? Let's see what he has to say about that. All right, type two diabetes has been clearly associated with carbohydrate intolerance and insulin resistance, and yet, People with type 2 diabetes are commonly put on insulin and also prescribe often a relatively high carb diet. A recently published study demonstrated some amazing results with type 2 diabetics uh, utilizing, uh, not surprisingly, low carb diets. A doctor has recently published uh, some pretty compelling research about it. And yet the American Diabetes Association, the top group in the USA that sets treatment guidelines, still denies that diet can be beneficial. Dr. David Unwin, who I've personally met over the years, uh, and is in fact at a conference with me right now and spent the last several days with him, has gotten some attention for his clinical success treating type 2 diabetes with low-carb diets. His published research has shown some quite, frankly, amazing results. What's interesting is we got 93% remission of prediabetes, so I started thinking about the prediabetics. 93% of them I can sort out. They never get to be diabetic. That's great. Of all the people who choose low-carb, 97% of them get improved blood sugar. 97%, that, that's quite uh, an effective treatment. So of the people that choose the low-carb approach at Norwood Avenue, 52% of them are going to achieve remission. Well, just think if you had a drug that could do that. It doesn't exist. Of course, his clinical success, which should be universally applauded, did also receive quite a bit of criticism. Dr. Unwin created some very useful graphics illustrating how different foods impact uh, glycemic uh, effect in, in, in the bloodstream and comparing it to teaspoons of sugar. And this graphic was actually adopted by NICE, the National Institute for Healthcare Excellence uh, in Britain that publishes healthcare guidelines. The Daily Mail <laughs> published an article which called into question and shared how other doc doctors did not agree and instead thought that you know a banana did not have a significant glycemic uh, index as Dr. Unwin's graphic had demonstrated. Now, a freedom of information request revealed that the Daily Mail wrote directly to NICE threatening them for publishing the guidelines. So this government organization caved under pressure from this media outlet. And now there is a change.org petition to have the graphics re and stated. Note that as of today, in August 2023, the petition has almost reached its goal. Why not take a moment to go ahead and sign that to help uh, get that restored? Now, circling back to the United States, remember that our American Diabetes Association says that there is no diabetes diet, and the official diabetes plate is fully at least one quarters full of carbohydrates. The 2023 ADA guidelines have been published, and they recommend a target blood glucose between 70 and an upper target of 180. Now 180 is very high, it's firmly in the diabetic range, and why set that as a target? An A1C level of less than seven is still a recommendation. The cutoff for diabetes is 6.5, so they're basically setting a tar target of remaining diabetic. Clearly, better dietary guidelines should have been included in these guidelines. This is absolutely some great information. I hope that you've learned something so far from this video. And in this clip, Dr. Eric Berg is going to tell you two things you can do to cure diabetes. So the two big things, and there's a lot of things that can trigger insulin, the two big things are number one, consuming sugar and frequent eating. So if we take a look at sugar and frequent eating, so which one of these do you think is more important to focus on? Okay, It's this one right here, frequent eating. So if you if you actually just make this one change and you eat less frequent, and let's say you do two meals a day, some people even do one meal a day, or even three meals a day, no snacking, you will see more change than if you cut out the sugar and kept eating all day long, okay? So this is the most important thing right here to focus on. This is the second most important thing to focus on. Now, if you do these in combination, it is very, very powerful. But the problem is that people 
in their mind, they don't realize what sugar is. They think, oh, it's just added sugar. Now, I'm talking about all the foods that turn into sugar very fast, like the breads, the pasta, cereal, the crackers, the biscuits, the waffles, the pancakes, the muffins. It's hard to go anywhere without running into sugar. I mean, I was at the grocery store the other day and I saw this wall of Gatorade. You know, it's all sugar water, sports drinks. It's everywhere. Juice, alcohol. Uh, there's a lot of hidden carbs and social events, birthday parties. I mean, it's in popcorn and chips and potatoes. It's everywhere. So you really have to just be aware of what sugar is or what a high glycemic food is and start to cut that down to the point where you keep it really, really low. And then frequent eating, that's another challenge too because all you're doing is you're spiking insulin and then what's happening, the insulin is bringing the sugars down, now you're going to be hungry again. So you want to gradually phase into this. Now, I created a real simple, easy, fast mini course down below. You could click that and just learn how to do this where I combine everything at once. So you'll see huge changes just by tweaking these two things right here. All right? So if you focus on that, that's going to be your greatest um, tool to overcome diabetes. I want to go back into Dr. Barry for a moment because he is one of the foremost leaders in this community. He has so much knowledge about the keto diet or carnivore diet, reversing disease, because he's a family doctor. And he's used it in his own life and in his practice and through YouTube to help hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, regain their health. This is what he has to say about being able to cure diabetes through your diet. Can you do it? Can you actually reverse type 2 diabetes through your diet? Let's see what he has to say. Can you really reverse type 2 diabetes, cure it even with just changes in your diet? Uh, the answer is yes. Yes, you can. But only in the last few years have I been able to help people actually reverse, cure, get rid of their type 2 diabetes permanently. There's more and more research being published showing just this thing, that it is possible to fix your type 2 diabetes with diet. There's a recent study by my good friend, Dr. David Unwin from the UK, where he's actually doing this with his patients in the clinic on a daily basis. Now, as this topic becomes more popular, which it's sure to do, there's going to be people popping up all over trying to sell you a type 2 diabetes reversal course for $5.99 or a bunch of supplements that you need for just $99 or some other product that they're claiming that you need in order to reverse your type 2 diabetes. And heads up, none of that stuff is necessary so that you can do it at home. You can actually start today. Right now, you can start to reverse your type 2 diabetes. So there are basically three macronutrients in all the food we eat. There is fat, there is protein, and there are carbohydrates. Now, fat does not raise your blood sugar at all when you eat it. Protein raises your blood sugar a little bit, but not much. And carbohydrates, those are the things which are basically long chains of sugar. They spike your blood sugar. And when you're eating multiple meals a day with too many carbohydrates, you're going to have high blood sugar all the time. And this is going to glycate or gum up all the cells and tissues in your body. And doctors actually check this with a test called a hemoglobin A1C. And this is the test that most doctors use to diagnose and to follow and to manage type 2 diabetes. So we've already established that fat doesn't really raise your blood sugar at all. So it's not involved with type 2 diabetes. Protein raises it a little, but it's, it's necessary. You have to eat protein to build all the different structures of your body, and it doesn't raise it that much. So doesn't it make common sense that if you want to get, get your blood sugar back down to normal, get your A1C back down to normal, that's the definition of reversing type 2 diabetes, then you want to eat a diet that's much lower in carbohydrates than the diet that you were eating that gave you type 2 diabetes to begin with. So what do you need to do? So the first step is to eliminate all sugars from your diet, all grains from your diet, and vegetable seed oils from your diet. Remove all these things from your diet. And you're going to add to your diet more red meat, more seafood, and more eggs, always with the yolk. Because remember, the fat in the yolk does not raise your blood sugar. 
So the question then becomes, well, how many carbohydrates total should I eat a day in order to cure my type 2 diabetes? And the answer is, it depends. Now, some people who are very young, very metabolically healthy, they can get away with eating 100 total grams of carbohydrates a day if the majority of these carbohydrates come from vegetables and berries and maybe a few fruits. Uh, some people have to turn down their carbohydrate intake to 50 total grams a day, some to 20, some to zero. I used to have prediabetes and I used to be severely obese and I reversed both of those conditions by following the exact information that I'm giving you for free in this video. So if you're young and metabolically healthy, then calculate how many carbohydrates, total carbohydrates, not net, uh, food manufacturers and supplement manufacturers love to talk about net carbs because it helps them sell products. But what you want to count is total carbohydrates in every bite of food that you eat. And if you come up with a number like 150 total grams a day, 200, 250, 350, some people out there, you know who you are, then you want to turn down that carbohydrate intake to 100 total grams of carbohydrates a day. Now, you don't even need those 100 grams, but Many young people can tolerate 100 total grams of carbs a day. So I want you to eat that diet. And so you're gonna eat until you're comfortably stuffed. You're not gonna portion control. You're not gonna calorie count. You can eat three meals a day or you can eat two meals a day because if you do eat two meals a day, then that increases the amount of time that you're fasting each day. And that's gonna help you cure your type two diabetes even faster. But if you wanna start with three meals a day, that's fine. And you want half of your plate covered with meat and eggs with the yolk, fatty meat preferably. And then if you want some veg, that's fine. If you want a few nuts, a few berries, that's fine. That's 100 total grams of carbs a day. Do that two or three times each day. Do that for 90 days and then go back to your doctor and say, hey doctor, I need you to recheck my labs. I have changed my diet. I want you to check an A1C and a fasting insulin. You'll want both of those numbers. And if your doctor doesn't understand why you need the fasting insulin, I have a book that I linked down in the show notes called Common Sense Labs that will explain it to you. And then you can explain it to your doctor. Then your doctor will order the damn test. Okay, so if that 100 total grams of carbs a day, if it got your A1C and your fasting insulin down to normal levels, congratulations, you have cured your type 2 diabetes. And as long as you keep your diet on the proper human diet spectrum of less than 100 total grams of carbs a day, you'll never develop type 2 diabetes again. And Dr. Barry also has a five-step process to help you reverse diabetes. Let's get into that right now. One more misconception or myth or lie that you may have been told, you may have even been told this by your doctor or your dietitian, is that type two diabetes is a chronic progressive condition that you're stuck with for the rest of your life that's just gonna keep getting worse and worse. This is absolutely not true. And I'm in the process of renaming this condition and we're gonna start calling it chronic carbohydrate overdose syndrome. And because when you call it that, it takes away the mystery. Oh, I have type two diabetes. I don't know why it's must be genetic. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Maybe I was born on the wrong day of the week. No, it's none of that. You have type two diabetes because of chronic carbohydrate overdose syndrome. Having type two diabetes is not your fault but it absolutely is your problem. And so you need to pay careful attention to these five easy steps, maybe write them down, maybe watch this video a second time so that you can do this yourself at home for free. Step number one is you need to stop all sugars, whether added sugars or naturally occurring sugars. And so obviously anything that has added sugar, either that you added or that the big food manufacturer added the sugar to, you need to stop eating those things. Hey, if you enjoy my compilation videos and you're not subscribed to my channel, hit the little subscribe button right down there. It just lit up for you and it'll let you know anytime I do a new video. Number two is you've got to stop eating all grains. Now the most common culprits are wheat, corn, oats, and rice. These are the big guys, but really any grain is gonna to be too high in carbohydrates. But what you may not know, what many people don't know, is that any grain, rice, oats, wheat, corn, amaranth, millet, quinoa, any of these, they convert immediately 
into sugar. Step three is to remove all vegetable oils from your diet. Canola oil, soybean oil, sunflower, safflower, peanut oil, corn oil, cottonseed oil. All of these guys are inflammatory in nature. They have a, a very high omega-6 to omega-3 ratio, but they also oxidize very rapidly uh, when you cook with them and also in your body. And many authorities, many experts believe that they also contribute to the pathology or the pathophysiology that ultimately leaves you with type 2 diabetes. Step four is to include lots of fatty meat in your diet. Fat and protein don't raise your blood sugar any meaningful degree. They also don't raise your insulin level to any meaningful degree. So you can get away with eating lots of fatty meat, which is fat and protein, plus tons of vitamins and minerals, because meat is full of those, and you're not gonna be raising your blood sugar or your insulin in a pathological manner. Step five is to get any carbohydrates you do eat from above ground, non-starchy vegetables, okay? Some people can reverse their type two diabetes by eating 100 total grams or less each day. Some people have to tighten this up more and eat only 50 total grams of carbohydrates each day. Uh, some people like me have to eat 20 total grams a day or even less to reverse and keep their type two diabetes reversed. We're gonna hear from Dr. Westman again because he has so much knowledge and experience and clinical experience in helping people with diabetes. He talks about how keto will help type two. Check it out. So when doctors didn't have any medications for type two diabetes, they understood that by changing the diet, you could actually treat and fix diabetes. So there was never a study showing that medication treatment of diabetes, type two diabetes that is, there was never a study that showed that medication treatment was better than using this diet. Yeah, did you know that you can actually fix type two diabetes in most cases? I'd say 90%. Yes, and th the reason for that is that when you address the underlying root causes of diabetes, the blood sugar elevation contribution from the food and the blood sugar elevation contribution from insulin resistance, which is from excess weight, body weight, then you can actually fix type two diabetes. The low carb keto diet is fantastic to treat type two diabetes because it lowers the dietary carbohydrate contribution to raising the blood sugar. And then it also leads to weight loss or loss of the insulin resistance that was actually causing the pre-diabetes and then the type two diabetes in the first place. So until you lose the weight, if you have extra weight, you may not see total resolution of the diabetes, but not to worry, all it takes is some time. So you get into this, uh, situation where if you feed someone with diabetes carbohydrates it raises the blood sugar you give a medicine to lower the blood sugar it can be actually fattening especially if you give insulin which is the fattening hormone if you give an insulin shot and that's why treating diabetes with insulin makes no sense in fact if you look in the blood of people with type 2 diabetes their blood insulin level is already too high so you're not gonna fix type two diabetes by giving more insulin. So the good news is that with the proper management, you can actually reverse and fix type two diabetes. Of course, the doctors today, I mean, they all should give you this knowledge and you should be told by your doctor that if you wanna go down the lifestyle route, you can fix the diabetes. Sadly, most doctors are not informing all their patients about this. So you can actually fix type two diabetes, which is uh, pretty exciting. There, there's no more happy patient in my clinic than one that I can get off of insulin. They're no longer shooting insulin shots. And then they're no longer checking their blood glucose with those finger stick things because they don't have diabetes anymore. It's, it's pretty fun. Now, if you're thinking about using a low carb keto diet and you have type two diabetes, please be careful. The blood sugars can drop immediately immediately on the first day. So you have to be monitoring the blood glucoses very carefully, ideally with a continuous glucose monitor. So you'll know the minute or five minute to five minute variation of the blood sugar, but you can also do it by just checking the blood sugars 
frequently, the four times a day recommendation is usually enough. So please be careful if you're taking medicines for diabetes or high blood pressure, because not that the diet's harmful, it's just the medications can become too strong very fast. So the low carb keto lifestyle is excellent for type two diabetes because it addresses the food contribution to the elevated blood glucose and also the underlying insulin resistance from the excess body weight. Finally, of course, with any lifestyle change, please consult your doctor or someone trained in how to do this. Um, it, it's very effective and, and uh, the right hands is safe and effective. Uh, and uh, it's really exciting to use a low carb keto lifestyle to treat diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and other medical conditions like that. I know a lot of you, whether you have diabetes, you're pre-diabetic, or you know someone that has diabetes, either you have a family doctor or someone you love has a family doctor that doesn't know what to do about diabetes other than give you the medications or give them the medications that they believe will help. I may be naive, but I don't believe that any doctor gets into that profession to not help people. But the thing is, with the amount of money that the pharmaceutical companies put into the medical schools and what they teach them, it's come a long way from the Hippocratic Oath, which is to do no harm, let thy food be thy medicine, thy medicine be thy food. It's come a long way from that. Now a lot of them just have to push pills. But luckily, these doctors know how to reverse medical conditions using the diet. You are what you eat is so true. So in this clip, Dr. Eckberg is going to tell you five things that your doctor has probably missed. So I did some research on diabetes cure, and here's what webmd.com says. Is there a diabetes cure? With all the research on diabetes and advances in diabetes treatments, it's tempting to think that someone would surely have found a diabetes cure by now. But the reality is that there is no cure for diabetes, neither type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes. So let's just make it really clear that for the purposes of this video, we're talking about type 2 diabetes, which is insulin resistance, too much insulin. Type 1 is a completely different thing, and we'll do some other videos on that, but that is a complete lack of insulin. So they're really two opposites. We're going to talk about type 2 diabetes here. So first we need to clarify some terms. When they say is there a diabetes cure? What does the word cure actually mean? So let's look at that. So I looked that up, the official definition. Cure can be a verb or a noun. As a verb, cure is to relieve a person of the symptoms of a disease. And they say that a synonym of, of a cure is to heal or restore to health. So here's the problem. They, first of all, they think that the cure is to relieve the symptom. They think that if you have cured someone and relieved them of a symptom, then you have healed them. They believe that health is merely the absence of symptoms. Okay? And that's the first problem. They don't understand physiology. They don't understand that diseases develop as a result of a long-term imbalance. For example, a heart attack. If someone gets a heart attack, that's the first symptom. But this person spent 20, 30 years developing the physiology, getting the body out of balance to the point where the heart attack was inevitable and the heart attack was the first symptom, but they were unhealthy, they were out of balance for 20, 30 years. So lack of symptoms does not mean that you're healthy. But when they're looking for a cure, they're simply looking for a way to relieve symptoms of a disease. That's the official definition. And how are they looking to do that? That comes in the noun. The cure can be a noun. And now they're looking for a substance that cures a disease. And a synonym for the substance would be medicine or medication. So the only way that you can cure something is to treat a symptom with a medication. That is the definition of a cure. Is there a cure for diabetes? No. 
Absolutely not. And we're not interested in a cure. We're going to talk about something completely different. We're going to talk about reversing diabetes. And we're going to talk about five facts, five truths, five realizations that is going to completely change the picture on how you look at these things. First, we have to understand the word cure is not what we're looking for. That the cure is not about reversing a disease and that's why they will never find a cure and we'll, we'll get into that. There will never be a pill to restore health. There may be a pill to treat a symptom but again they're not going to change the underlying conditions and this is what we're going to talk about. Here's a big one for you. The number two fact you have to understand is Type 2 diabetes is not a disease. And now you're going, hey, whoa, now you lost me. You made some sense from time to time, but here you're just really getting off. So what do I mean type 2 is not a disease? Well, let's talk about that. And we need to understand a few things as part of that. That it's not a disease, it's a physiological adaptation. Okay. It's not a disease because there's nothing broken. There's nothing missing. The body parts are still there. The pancreas is still making insulin, but the body is responding. It's adapting to something. That brings us to part three, that the body is smart. It has homeostasis. This, the body isn't random. Everything the body does is on purpose. Everything that gets out of balance in the body is because something is making it go out of balance. Something is pushing it out of balance. There is a principle in the body called homeostasis and that's the principle of balance. That's the principle of healing. That the body will always attempt to return to homeostasis. Homeostasis is balance. Something pushes it out of balance. As soon as the push is gone, as soon as the pushing factor is gone, the body returns to homeostasis. That's sort of like gravity. That gravity works on water. A, a, a spring, a water stream coming down the mountainside will always attempt to bring that water down to sea level. Always. No exceptions. The body will always attempt to return to homeostasis. Just like the water returns to the sea, the body returns to homeostasis. Gravity doesn't work sometimes. Healing doesn't work sometimes. Physiology doesn't work sometimes. It always works. That's just the way it is. It's built into the fabric of nature that your body is designed to do the right thing for the right reasons. If it appears that it's not doing the right things, there is a factor, there's something creating an imbalance. Okay, So we have to get to that understanding of the body's innate intelligence, the principle of homeostasis, and that physiology is this principle, it's these factors, it's the study of these factors that, that guide healing, that guide homeostasis. If type 2 diabetes is not a disease, then what is it? It is an adaptation. What is an adaptation? It's when your body adapts, it copes, it changes in response to something. So let's take a few examples just to make you more familiar with that. What is hypertrophy? It's when something grows larger. So a bodybuilder, he puts pressure, he puts stress on his muscles. He puts a tremendous stress, repeated many times, many hours a day. And now the body senses, hey, you know, if I'm going to be able to keep up with this work in the future, I have to change. I have to build more muscle. I have to create more muscle fiber so I can cope better with this stress in the future. That's an adaptation. That growing muscle is an adaptation to an imposed demand. We have pushed the muscle and the muscle responds. The opposite happens with someone who's a couch potato. Or if you break your arm or you break a leg and you put a cast on it, 
Now, when you take that cast off a couple months later, there's virtually no muscle left. There is atrophy. Because when we don't use the muscle, the body senses, hey, you know, this, there's not much use for this muscle tissue. If, this, if the owner of this muscle isn't going to start using it, I'm going to downsize it. I'm going to downregulate it. I don't want to spend precious resources rebuilding that muscle if it's not going to be used for anything. Use it or lose it. That's where hypertrophy and atrophy comes in. But everything the body does is in response to something. If you normally live at sea level and you have a certain amount of red blood cells and then you move up in the mountains at 6,000 feet above sea level, what's going to happen? Your body is going to upregulate the production of red blood cells. So now, all of a sudden, you got 20% more red blood cells. Why? Because there's less oxygen in the air. That's the stress. So there's an imposed demand. Your body needs to make more red blood cells so it can still transport the oxygen when there's not so much of it around. That's an adaptation. It's a physiological adaptation. So what does that have to do with, with diabetes? Well, diabetes is a late stage result. It's a late stage of insulin resistance. So when we eat things that trigger insulin, primarily sugar and carbohydrates, then insulin production goes up. If we do that six times a day, then insulin production goes up six times a day. And insulin then starts pushing blood sugar into the cell, and the cell is grateful at first for this fuel, but then eventually when the cell has had enough fuel, it starts resisting, it starts adapting. It's a physiological adaptation because the cell can only use so much fuel. So when there's more and more and more and more coming, what's the cell going to do? It's going to be smart. It's going to be intelligent. It's going to say, enough is enough. I'm going to start closing down the gates so I don't get flooded with all this fuel. That's what insulin resistance is. It's not the body being stupid. It's not the body being random or mistaken or broken or flawed. The body is doing exactly what it's supposed to. When it's being overwhelmed, it's going to try to oppose that factor that's overwhelming. And it's going to become insulin resistant until that avalanche of fuel and sugar starts to pull back. So this is a crucial factor in the understanding of holistic health. That there are no mistakes in the body. And there are virtually no diseases. Uh, as, at least not when we're talking about functional problems. When we're talking about high blood sugar and diabetes and digestive problems, we're talking about functional problems. We're talking about imbalances that develop over time because we're pushing the body and the body is adapting to respond. So type 2 diabetes is not a disease. It's a physiological adaptation. It's an intelligent response to an unbalanced environment. And the in unbalanced environment is our modern food. It's food that we have never ever seen before. It's, in, it's carbohydrates and sugar and processed foods in amounts the, the human body has never experienced, not even close. So once we understand that, number four is more obvious. It kind of follows that when they say that there is no cure in the medical world, they're right. Because what would that mean? If the body is always on purpose and it always returns to balance, then a cure would be a way of inventing a medication, a substance, that could somehow make the body be happy out of balance. That we keep insulting it with an overwhelm, with an avalanche of fuel, and we expect to be able to create a pill to maintain that imbalance and keep the body happy. It can't work, it won't work, because that would be like trying to find a cure for gravity. We can't do it. 
there's never going to be a cure for physiology. Physiology is the body's tendency to return to balance. Gravity is water's tendency to return to the sea. We won't find a cure, we can't find a cure, because it's not the way it's supposed to be. And if the water is held up by a dam, then it can appear that the water isn't returning to the sea for a while. We can observe an imbalance, we can observe high blood pressure, we can observe insulin resistance and, and high blood sugar, but the moment that we remove the barrier, the moment that we remove the interference, the factor that has been upsetting the balance, then the water starts flowing again. We don't have to teach the water to flow again, it already knows how. Gravity never stops working. Your body's healing, your body's homeostasis never stops working because it can't. It's built in to the innate intelligence and to the very fabric of nature. But it's easy to understand why there is so much confusion if we have these two different worldviews. If we on the one hand understand the innate intelligence and homeostasis, and on the other hand in the medical world they believe that the body is random and that it's mistaken and that it breaks down for no reason on occasion, that it does stupid things, that it randomly starts resisting insulin. So the official view of insulin resistance is that the cells are no longer responding normally to blood glucose. In other words, the implied statement there is the cells are not responding normally to normal food anymore. And of course normal food today is 300 grams of carbohydrates, 170 grams of sugar, and the, base, the food pyramid with the base being starches. Okay? Of course, if you believe that is normal food, then you're not going to understand anything that we're talking about here. We have to first put the body back in the picture of what is normal food for humans? What have we been eating for the longest time? And we've discussed all these topics in more detail on other videos, so feel free to check those out for the, for the complete version of, of each of these. So this brings us to number five. So the, we started out asking, is there a cure for diabetes? And we've pretty much come up with, based on the medical definition of a cure, no there isn't. But once we understand that type 2 diabetes is not a disease, it is a physiological adaptation, then number five becomes the obvious question, can you reverse a physiological adaptation? Yes. So adaptations are reversible and once we start understanding this then all that it comes down to is that we want to reduce, reverse the factors that forced the adaptation in the first place. So if you move up in the mountains and start making more red blood cells you're, and then you move back to sea level, then your body is going to start down-regulating red blood cells because you don't need so many anymore. 20% less will do just fine at sea level. And if you go back in the mountains, it'll start going back and forth, back and forth. It will do it again because it's intelligent. So if the insulin resistance developed because we forced certain things on the body, then the moment we stop forcing it, then it will start returning to homeostasis. It's as simple as that. What does it mean then to stop the factors? It means eat less of the food that stimulates insulin. And what is that? Primarily sugars and processed starches any kind of starch really, but, but especially processed starches. So we want to eat less sugar, we want to be moderate to very little fruit if you're already insulin resistant. We want to cut out grains, both processed and complex, because there's very little difference in blood sugar impact. And we want to start eating more fats, 
moderate protein and more whole foods because they have the fiber and they have the whole package of what you need. We also want to eat less frequently because if you eat something that stimulates insulin and then you do it once, you get one burst of insulin. If you do it six times, now you're pushing insulin six times. You're giving the, re the cell six reasons to become insulin resistant. The longer you go between meals, the bigger the chance, the greater the opportunity for the cell to start burning through some of that fuel so that maybe it gets hungry again. Maybe it will want some fuel sometime in the future. So there's lots and lots of different videos. We've done videos on each one of these on LCHF, low carb, high fat, on ketogenic diet, on intermittent fasting. So that's about reducing the, the insulin production and the frequency. And then of course, you also want to add in some exercise and some stress management because exercise makes the muscles more insulin sensitive. It gives your body a chance to burn through some fuels besides all the other benefits of exercise and become a little more insulin sensitive. And stress management is because stress produces higher blood sugar. Stress causes cortisol releases and cortisol raises blood sugar which raises insulin and you can actually become insulin resistant pretty much from stress alone. The more of these things that you do, the greater your chance of reversing these adaptations. So don't wait for a type 2 diabetes cure and understand when they say that there is no cure, understand why they're saying that. They're speaking a different language. They're talking about a substance to reduce a symptom, whereas what you're really looking for is a healing process. It's a reversal of the adaptation. And there's never going to be a pill that can cure, that can fix the homeostasis because the body is always intelligent, it's always adapting to the imbalance. And if you have an imbalance, then just remove the cause for that imbalance and your body will go right back to doing what it's supposed to do. So both healing and gravity are laws of nature. They always work. Do we know if they're going to work tomorrow? We can't say for sure, but my bet would be that gravity and healing are still going to work tomorrow. Dr. Berg is going to share in this clip what he would eat if he had diabetes, which is the same thing that I would eat probably if I had diabetes and didn't want to go 100% carnivore. Check this out. So here's the thing. What is the perfect diet? Do we need, is there such a thing as essential carbohydrates? No, there is no essential carbohydrates. There are essential fatty acids, essential amino acids, that's proteins, but there's no such thing as essential carbohydrates. How much carbohydrate do we need or how much do, are we, do we require? Zero. We don't need carbohydrates. In fact, we're better without carbohydrates. What do we need to do? We need to keep our proteins less and a moderate amount, but with each meal because we don't want to go too far because our body needs proteins for structural repair. But what does that leave us with? You guessed it, fat. So if you are going to correct a problem with insulin, like in a diabetic, a pre-diabetic, like 50% of the population, it is totally and utterly necessary to increase the fat because that's the only thing that's left. And fat will not increase insulin. So you can get away with consuming it. It's very fulfilling. It has fat-soluble vitamins. It's very healthy and it's the absolute best thing for a diabetic because they're not going to be hungry and you can run off that fuel source and you can take all the pressure off the pancreas. So in the last 50 years, we've completely eliminated all the fat and look at all the illnesses going up, but we replaced those with carbohydrates. Any of these foods that you see that are light or low fat or skim, what they're doing is they lower the fat and they replace them with carbohydrates. Very bad. Now, if you're trying to lose weight and you don't have a blood sugar problem, um, we still want to add fats in there, but maybe we don't want to do a lot of fats. We'll just do a certain amount of fats, just until you're satisfied. Because you could be burning fat, but the fat that you're burning is actually the fat from the diet, not your own body. Okay? But if you're a diabetic or blood sugars, you better increase that fat to be able to heal the entire system. Okay? But I always, always love when people say, well, I'm doing a diet. 
and I'm going to lose the weight, and then I'm going to go back to what I was eating before. No. You have to understand, you have to be educated on what to eat and use judgment. But we're trying to just give you principles so you could think with it logically and be aware of what you're putting in your mouth. Because fat is very enjoyable. And you could actually have sugar alternatives to make fat taste sweet as well. Okay? So 50% of the population has insulin resistant already. And they don't know it. it's, not being, it's not showing up on a blood test. <clears throat> sugar actually stimulates hunger. Yes. Have you ever go to a Chinese restaurant? Oh my gosh. What do they do? Rice, meat, sugar, lots of sugar. Americanized Chinese restaurants, right? It's all the sugar coating bread. And then they stick the MSG on there on top of it. So this is like a massive M uh, insulin spike. What happens? Oh my gosh, it's so delicious. You can't stop eating. You eat more than you're, you should be. And then what happens an hour later? You're starving. Why? Because you spike the carbohydrate and then you spike the insulin and it comes down as a low sugar because the insulin has to work so hard to push, that, push all the sugar out and now you end up with a hyperreactive low blood sugar and you're going to crave, you're going to be irritable, you're going to feel dizzy and thirsty. I mean, think about what happens when you go to a Chinese restaurant. What do you do? You drink all this water because you're so thirsty and you gain two pounds the next day. That's not fat, that's water weight from the retention because when you, sugar tends to hold a tremendous amount of water. Okay, so when you get rid of sugar, you lose a lot of water weight. Um, so basically, insulin triggers hunger. And going on a diet with including too many carbs is like insane because you're going to be hungry all the time. You're not going to stick to it. I mean, this is not that difficult once you get the facts on this. The guidelines, guidelines, guidelines f for carbohydrates by the American Diabetes Association <laughs> is 40 to 60 grams of carbohydrate a day. This is insane, but this is what they're recommending. So look what happens. They have high blood pressure to begin with. They take their medication. They say, include the, uh, the 40 to 60 grams of carbohydrate, but healthy carbs like whole grains and fruits and and some sugars and alcohol, two glasses, right? So they're, they're recommending all the orange juice, whatever. So here they are, they take the medication, which lowers the blood sugar, and they tell you, eat the carbs, which raise the blood sugar, but take your medication to lower the blood sugar, eat the carbs. So it's the perfect business to keep selling insulin and metformin and diabetes medication. It is the perfect business because you're giving the, they're actually creating the diabetes. The American Di uh, Diabetes Association is creating diabetes um, and keeping you on the pills. And then they tell you, you can't come off of it. You never get healed. They brainwash the medical doctors into thinking that, no, it cannot be cured. You're on it for the rest of your life and there's no other hope. That's, what, that's what's out there. It's crap. Um, I believe that um, near all diabetes can be fully and utterly corrected. But you can't then go back to your same ways. It's just, when I, what I mean corrected is like stabilized. So if you maintain that lifestyle, you will maintain the blood sugars. Um, it's actually one of the easiest things to deal with. 40% of all heart disease is related to carbohydrate and sugar. Yeah, and diabetes. So right there, we could literally eliminate heart disease if we just cut the sugar out. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of give you some basics on the importance of keeping the sugar out of your diet if you have any chance of getting healthy at all. I really hope this video has helped you if you have diabetes or someone that you know has diabetes. If you want to hear more about what doctors have to say about the keto diet, watch this video next. It's going to give you some great information that you may not know. Please consider sharing this video with someone you think it'll help. Thank you guys so much for watching. Let's cure this diabetes epidemic in America, save our friends and family, and I'll see you on the next video.